what is really going on between me and William Wolfe. In this video, I'll explain a little bit about it and then show what's going on beneath the surface. On Twitter, you might have seen the other day, he was talking about how he wants to help protect churches from the woke influence. And I simply posted a photo of the man who baptized him, baptizing him. And then a different photo of the man who commissioned him for ministry or was training him, doing something in front of the whole church, praying together. So this was William Wolfe with Mark Dever. Mark Dever is one of the leading woke figures within the Southern Baptist Convention. He's the man who platformed Tabidi Anyabule, aka Ron Burns. And I mean, this is a man who defends people who vote for Democrats. I say Mark Dever has defended voting for Democrats. And I can show you, if you Google search, is Mark Dever woke? The very first result is an article written by myself. So you'll know, like, you, there are reasons to believe this. And I simply asked, William, is this pastor soft woke? As you say that you're protecting people from soft wokeness. And this infuriated him. And so to clarify my intentions, I pointed out, look, if you don't know how to answer this question, that's a problem. If you read this and you choose not to answer, that's a real problem because it's common knowledge at this point that this pastor is woke. And you're positioning yourself as somebody who wants to combat the wokeness within the denomination, the Southern Baptists, or within the mainstream evangelical movement. And you're Albert Muller's intern, or at least you were a while back. You're studying at Southern. You're, you're collaborating with people that are in these circles that were the same people that were promoting wokeness for a long time. So we're concerned. And perhaps you could clarify, do you think that these people who have trained you and influenced you and platformed you, do you think that these people that have promoted all these woke ideas are actually promoting woke ideas. Like, what is your position on that matter? It seems like the kind of thing that you'd want to know. And what is my reason for asking it? Well, I can see why he's mad that I would ask it. Because, here's the deal. If he doesn't answer, then it shows that he's uncomfortable with confronting wokeness, even though he's been positioning himself as somebody who is an expert against wokeness. But if he does answer, he's going to be in the position of saying, yeah, these are problems. And then I'm going to ask him, well, why haven't you said anything about it for the last several years? Or if you might say, no, they're not woke, then I would say, well, I don't think you know what you're talking about. And here's the reasons why you don't know what you're talking about. And so, sure, I'm trying to push him down a path in order to find out what he knows and what he believes. But do you really want to be led by evangelical leaders, thought leaders, pastors, organizational leaders who cannot tell you the answer to what they believe, especially on important issues that are under discussion currently. So that's the context for this discussion. Now, to give you a little bit more of the background, the foundations behind this discussion, let's talk about where my mind goes. I think that if you are claiming to defend Christianity from wokeness, then these are some basic standards that you ought to be able to conform to. One, you ought to know what wokeness means. And two, you ought to be brave enough to name the main figures responsible for the present crisis. So, what is wokeness? Let's talk about it. This is the foundational issue that I think that William Wolfe is missing. Wokeness means sympathetic to Marxist analysis. Specifically, a woke idea is one that draws from either critical race theory or the diversity, equity, inclusion frameworks. If you're not familiar with those, you need to look it up, but you've heard them. You just maybe didn't identify them as those frameworks, but you've heard the idea of there being a wage gap and their idea of being systemic oppression and injustice and we need more uh, we need more diversity and representation in different jobs and so this is this whole framework of thinking about the world and the problems in the world this is wokeness so wokeness means accepting and teaching this overall message that we're getting from the cathedral so to speak from the media the school system the state even that is basically unequal outcomes in society are a proof of injustice. They're concerned with unequal outcomes. They're concerned with increasing representation across all demographic groups and using state power and social pressure to encourage these things to happen. So on this model, here is what justice is. And this is what we're debating is what justice is. On this woke model, justice requires egalitarian outcomes. Egalitarianism is this key idea. It's a key moral concept within the woke movement. So 
On this theory, if you have unequal outcomes, then you are either a victim of injustice, or perhaps a perpetrator, or perhaps complicit in a system of injustice. You've heard this a lot, haven't you? So I want you to distinguish equality under the law from this concept of egalitarianism. This is an extended quote I'll share from Ayn Rand. Equality, in a human context, is a political term. It means equality before the law, equality of fundamental inalienable rights which every man possesses by virtue of his birth as a human being, which may not be infringed or abrogated by man-made institutions such as titles of nobility or the division of men into castes established by law with special privileges granted to some and denied to others. That's what she's concerned about, equality under the law. And then this is what Ayn Rand writes, the egalitarians are seeking, in her words, not political, but metaphysical equality. The equality of personal attributes and virtues, regardless of natural endowment or individual choice, performance, and character. It is not man-made institutions, but nature, i.e. reality, that they propose to fight by means of man-made institutions. Since nature does not endow all men with equal beauty or equal intelligence, and the faculty of volition leads men to make different choices, the egalitarians propose to abolish unfairness of nature and of volition, and establish universal equality in fact, in defiance of facts. And there is the contradiction. So that's the end of the Rand quote. Now, this is the spirit of the age. If you haven't noticed it, this rage against inequalities. This egalitarian doctrine of justice, it has become known today as wokeness. You've awakened to this new concept of justice. It's the spirit of the age. It's the wicked spirit of the age. Now the main goal of the woke guys, the leftists, the socialists, social justice warriors, and so on, is to use the government to create equal outcomes on all people by policies that explicitly treat one person differently than another. Equal outcomes, different treatment under the law. The opposite of justice. So this woke spirit can be found in the work of John Rawls in his book A Theory of Justice from the 1970s. It's quite influential. It's also similar to what you see in Karl Marx. Karl Marx used egalitarianism as a key idea when he was creating his philosophy, which we now call Marxism. For that reason, wokeism can be understood as a form of neo-Marxism. Now, there are differences among all these terms that I've laid out. There's a whole constellation of claims, and they don't all agree with each other, and they're not all exactly identical, but they all amount in the final analysis to a morally indignant claim of a person against his society, which amounts to that meme that you see of Karl Marx, give me that for free. That's what they're asking for, ultimately, is race-based reparations or something like that. Now I want you to notice how based Ayn Rand is, although nobody would normally refer to her as based. Based in the sense of she's willing to acknowledge basic facts of reality. Listen to that quote that she said, Nature does not endow all men with equal beauty or equal intelligence. I propose that that fact is the main reason why Marxists and wokists are mad at God and they're mad at capitalism. Or if you don't believe in God, you might say you're mad at nature and the way that things are created. And you don't believe in nature and you think that nature can be malleable and changed. But this causes them to rage against the state of things. Which, as a Christian, I say that's the state that was created by God. God created men unequal in abilities, equal under him in their responsibilities, and ought to be equal under the law but quite unequal in their abilities or their appearances. Now, one of the reasons that we have the huge battle between the left and the right that seems never to end is that almost no one knows what to do with the, this foundational truth, that there are inequalities. So someone might ask, in what way does the right have trouble with this truth? It's clear that the left does. Their entire system is designed to abolish this truth. But in what ways does the right have a problem with this truth that people are unequal. Well, many people are uncomfortable naming this fact of inequality. Many people on the right and on the left are uncomfortable with it. It reminds me of a situation when I was in a teacher's college. I was studying to be a music teacher, and one of the classes was talking about inequality among the students and about how it all basically is the system's fault. And I asked the teacher, isn't it possible that some students are just better than others? And the 
liberal lady that was sitting right next to me looked like she was about to barf. She stood up in the middle of the presentation from the teacher and moved to the other side of the class so that she could be away from me because I had, I had the offensiveness to ask that question. Isn't it possible that some students are just better than others? See, the leftists are grossed out by that question. And the people on the right, the people that now often call themselves based, are the people that have looked at that question and they've squarely said, yes, some people are actually better than others. So I think that's sort of a based idea. We're looking at reality here. But if you look at the mainstream conservative movement, the Republican Party, do they look at reality? Are they willing to confront this fact? Look, many on the right are uncomfortable even naming it. And I think the right does not have a robust philosophy about what causes inequality. And because of that, the right has been susceptible to claims from the left, two claims in particular. One, you guys don't have an answer to why there are disparities while we, the left, do. And two, whenever we try to bring up disparities, you get all shifty, evasive. You try to say that the free market is the solution or that we should not be concerned about disparities or that the disparities are not so significant as we say they are. Okay, so the right has not made a strong enough effort to own the moral narrative here. The left always tries to own the moral narrative. And what is the consequence of this? Well, if one side says this is a major moral injustice and they commit to saying it over a decade or century, the other side says, I just don't see it. Who do you think is gonna win rhetorically? Well, it's the side that keeps on seeing the injustice and finding new ways to convince people of it. So the right is going to need to learn to see the injustices or to see the inequalities or the problems or the, the pain in some way. Why did Bill Clinton win? He said, I, I feel your pain or something like that. The right needs to learn to talk about injustice, to explain why it happens, what to do about it, and it needs to sound like a program of positive actions. But the positive actions need to be increasing freedom, reducing government meddling that causes harm, and raising our voices to help people understand that they are not victims and that they do not require the government's intervention to make their lives better. That's the overall approach. But we need to position those not as, hey, there's not really a problem with the status quo. Rather, we need to position it as we have a vision for change. Now, the right does not need to shy away from discussing the concerns that the left keeps raising about differences in pay between genders or differences in wealth across racial groups. We don't need to ignore it or downplay it. What we need to say is these are facts indeed. And in fact, we think that X is a problem. And in fact, we think that Y is not a problem. And let me explain our position on that. And then let me explain our proposed solutions to that. And that is how we take control of the moral narrative. Instead, the mainstream right is trying to say, yeah, you make some good points. I believe in your values too, but let's be practical and not go to extremes. We don't have that in the budget this year. That's generally what you see from Republicans. Now I can see why there needs to be a new understanding, a new concept, a new vision within the Republican Party and within the conservative movement. But the vision that I see from William Wolfe and from the American Reformer and New Founding guys is let's have more state intervention. And it's the exact opposite. We need a more self-aware, more confident vision of why the state should be smaller. Sure, there are things that are currently legal that ought to be made illegal, such as abortion and drag queen story hour, which is clear child abuse. These things are easily made illegal under the classical liberal framework. So we should stop debating about the classical liberal framework's relative ability to do this compared to the vision of the Christian nationalists. And that's one of the key contentions that I have against what William Wolfe is doing is that he keeps on raising this issue of drag queen story hour as if the only way to stop drag queen story hour is to follow me on the path that I have, which is generally toward more statism, at least as far as I can tell from the kind of articles that he writes and agrees with. And I mean, the fact that Timon Klein and Stephen Wolf associate with him and he with them, it's really clear what they believe in. They believe that the state should be run by Christians and that it should squash atheism. That it should arrest people who teach falsely. Why does William Wolf associate with those people? And then, while he positions himself as a fighter against the woke, he's associating with Albert Moeller, who is one of the leading enablers of the woke trend. And it makes me think, when these people say that they're going to fight against wokeism, what do they really mean? 
And when they say that they're conservatives, do they really mean they're opposed to statism and authoritarianism? Could somebody like Stephen Wolf even say that he is in principle opposed to the idea that the government could mandate an injection for a, like some kind of vaccination of some kind? Wait a minute. These people that want to be our leaders and that want to solve our problems and lead us out of slavery are going to lead us into a different form of slavery. It's just a different form where they are in charge. And they're hypocrites and they're frauds. And I think you can see that in the way that William Wolfe responded to my tweet question, because somebody who is a man of integrity would say, let me answer your question. I don't like the way you asked it. I don't like you, but let me answer your question. And that's not what we got from him. That's a problem. It's especially a problem for him because 43,000 people on Twitter saw his meltdown. So that's an overview of some of my thoughts about the divide. The Republicans need to take control of the moral narrative, and that means rejecting the premise that need constitutes a claim. The people at American Reformer, people like William Wolf, people in the National Conservative Movement like Ramazzoni or Stephen Wolf, they're not they're not going to reject the collectivist premise. They're going to talk about the need of their tribe. And, you know, Stephen Wolf explicitly identifies himself as being part of the white tribe. This is not the way that conservatives are going to win. This is not a good direction for conservatism if winning is the goal, which I question whether it even is. So we need to stop accepting the moral premises of our opponents and denying only their prescriptions. Rather, we need to go back to the fundamental level of the premises. And we need to show why our ideological approach to pro-liberty is good. But instead what we're getting is this movement on the dissident right that is still continuing to accept premises from the leftists. So when they see inequality, they think like, like, for example, you know that famous picture where there's a race and some people start at the starting line, but some people start 20 feet behind the starting line, and you ask yourself, who's going to win? Well, of course, the person who has the advantage at the start. The leftists characterize this whole thing as a zero-sum game or a fixed pie type of a situation. And they say, well, of course, the people of color, or the people of this gender or this identity of some kind are going to have a hard time competing. But what they don't realize is that life is not a zero-sum situation. And so we have these guys on the dissident ride or these guys in the National Conservative Movement that want to look at this whole setup and they don't know how to say what's the fundamental premise behind this that we should reject. It's the zero-sum idea. Instead they want to say, well put us in charge and we'll make things better. Or let's redefine who, who we think actually has the advantages. I think that it's been an injustice in the exact opposite direction, and I think that therefore that my party should be in charge of it. And so you see this kind of situation where it just becomes like, okay, so I see you are on the dissident right. You are woke, but in the opposite direction. You're using Marxist analysis and class analysis, but in the opposite direction. And then they're saying things like, racial integration has failed. We need to balkanize the nation into our racial groups so that we can then begin to associate with people only of our own subculture or culture or race or whatever it may be, or religion. My goodness, is this the alternative? Do you see what this is going to do to the conservative movement? People that advocate for balkanization and for little dissident states and for maybe all of the Presbyterians moving to one state and all the Baptists moving to another state, these people are going to be laughed out of the public discussion. This is no vision for winning. It's just going to make our movement look ridiculous. And then you have the white identitarians explicitly saying that the way to handle the fact of inequality among individual men is to ascribe those inequalities to race. Oh my goodness. Look, this is not what Rand was saying in her quote, although she sounds pretty based by our standards today because she's not an egalitarian. She was not talking about racial inequalities. She was talking about the fact that in any nation, in any town, no matter what race you are, there's going to be some people that work harder than others. There's going to be some people that are smarter. There's going to be some people that were born with more blessings because their family was more wealthy. And the point that Rand is making 
is that this is going to apply in society as a fact. No matter what we do legally, no matter what you force other people to pretend is the truth, people will have different outcomes. People will have different starting points as well. People do not all have the same work ethic or the same ability to work. When people are not all the same, the outcomes will not be the same, and that is okay. That is actually as it ought to be. It's not an injustice, because look, when you allow inequality in outcomes, that creates a society where people understand that cause and effect are going to run their course, and that if you have the goal to elevate your position, you're gonna to have to work hard. You're gonna to have to work smart, and you're going to have to try to rise. This creates a healthy incentive structure, which is completely inverted from the kind of society that rewards need, which actually, it's a perverse incentive structure. Ayn Rand's approach is valuable because she does not say capitalism is guilty of all of the crimes that you attribute to it. No, she's going to own the moral narrative. She will argue, in effect, that all the crimes and problems attributed to capitalism come from denying logic and denying nature. And capitalism is the system of accepting logic and accepting nature. And it is from that choice and that commitment that we are able to build prosperity. Rand goes on and she will say, in effect, this is my words, capitalism is the exact solution to the problem of poverty, to the problem of human weakness. It is the system in which we are free to better ourselves and in which each person can justly be rewarded for finding ways to help other people, even those less fortunate. So here are my thoughts to summarize and to conclude. Before we can show the unconvinced that capitalism is the answer to many human problems, we need to validate what we can about how the unconvinced are seeing the problems. So don't champion yourself as this advocate of the based, or of the white nation, or of the white tribe. Talk about the actual problems that your opponents are facing. This is where the right has failed, and this is the opportunity that we have to begin to succeed, but only ideology makes it possible. You cannot be anti-ideological like Stephen Wolf is, or like William Wolf is, or like Yoram Hazoni is, and own the moral narrative. This will fail. The left has an ideology. The right does not. History demonstrates that the party with a bad ideology always defeats the party with no ideology. And if the right is going to win the battle for liberty in the U.S., it will need to develop an ideology of liberty. It will need a positive vision for how to improve life using that ideology of liberty. That is what has been missing. That is the way forward. And that is why when I see people like William Wolfe, who do not have an ideology of liberty, when I see people like Stephen Wolfe who are attacking liberty explicitly, or American reformer who set out to join with Catholic integralists and give more power to the state and create this combination between religion and state, I say, no, that's not the vision of the conservatives. You are infiltrating the conservative movement and leading it astray. And one of the easiest ways to see that is the fact that you can't even name the leading proponents of wokeness within mainstream evangelicalism while you try to position yourself as a champion against wokeness. Go home. You don't know what the words mean, and it's quite questionable whether you have integrity. Who is Cody liable to say all these things? It doesn't matter. They're true. And we need a hundred or a thousand men who are willing to say the same. Thank you for watching.